Well, uh, thanks for coming to this uh, artist talk. Well, uh, I am Pascal Dubois, and uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Arcade Cardiff for giving me this uh, opportunity to show the work of a Phil King. So, I think it was a well of a due solo show, really. It was, uh, yeah, I would say. So uh, it's all uh, it's all yours now. Okay, great. Thank you. Hi guys. Um, I'd love to see more. <laughs> thanks to Pascal for organising all this. And yeah. And uh, yeah, thanks for me. Thank you. It's been brilliant. Anyway, um, I just thought I would. Oh yeah. All right. I thought I'd start just by uh, introducing myself. I mean, there's the press release and stuff, but um, I've been doing this a while now. Um, I went to Bath Academy of Art, which is no longer Bath Academy of Art, it's now Bath Spa University. And um, when I look at this stuff now, I can see where I came from, you know, that, that I've gone back to stuff on my BA. So um, it's quite an important time, you know, when you're working on your BA. So uh, my experience was, was that I had a really, really good painter as a tutor called Peter Kinley. And um, he, he really, um, he really had a great effect on me. And uh, on, a, on a painterly kind of level. So I kind of had this traditional uh, or very, very kind of modernist idea of painting that I went through. But at the last, about two weeks before the end of term, or before my, before, well, about a month, we had a visit from Yanis Canellis, who is a, an art Pavera artist, kind of on the level of someone like Joseph Boyes at the time, which was kind of explosive. And it um, uh, was very difficult to deal with because I really connected with it. My background is, is that I, um, when I was three years old, I'm from Bristol, but my, uh, my father was a Concorde engineer and there was a lot of families went to the south of France, in Toulouse, in the 60s. So I grew up for five years in the south of France. So I had this sort of double splits of upbringing and I could never really reconcile the two. So this show that um, Yannis Canales did in Bath, which I helped invigilate and I went along, had a really big impact because he was this sort of installation artist who called himself a painter. So I had this uh, difficulty to match, and he's also Greek, but Italian. And he brought this whole kind of, in my mind, uh, southern Mediterranean aesthetic to Bath, which is like in the West Country. And I always had this clash between the kind of Latin culture and, and the sort of um, back in Bristol at the age of nine, back to the sort of Filton, Patchway area, which is kind of grey. So there was like a clash, you know, I could never quite reconcile it. And I found that there was this sort of um, match made in heaven, really, you know, that this guy connected and it, and, it, and it kind of challenged all the ideas. Three years of work suddenly were like, oh, what's this? And it took me years to figure it out. And I, I realized that my show, you know, like what I do now is kind of linked to that kind of tension, if you like. You know, that there's a kind of tension between very uh, concrete materials, very, you know, like, like um, it, almost an installation idea, where you're, you're, you're back from painting, you're looking at it from a distance, and actually being very involved in painting yourself as something you submerge yourself in, almost like an illusory space. So there's the kind of materiality of an object in space, and then there's the, the kind of illusion, illusory world that painting offers, and uh, kind of and you go back to modernism, it's like the utopia, if you like. You say, like, Matisse was very involved in, you know, the idea of um, a paradise, you know, or a kind of colour. And then, but you have this very, uh, uh, the, art, the Art of Pavera artists were very much involved in having, like, the reality of things in space and the kind of um, literal, you know, very much like the minimalists in America, you have very kind of literal, uh, relationship to objects. So I kind of had this 
balance, you know. And it kind of manifested in my paintings. I would start like making holes in my paintings. Yeah. So people ask where the holes come from, and it was like um, almost like breaking the illusion. And Alcavera did come from someone like Lucio Fontana, who made whole, literally cut space his paintings to open it up to the world, you know, to break with, to kind of make fiction, if you like, that you inhabit, you kind of inhabit uh, an artistic space. And the time, when, when, you, when you kind of, um, I mean, a lot of my drawing as well, like, you know, I used to doodle a lot at school. So you kind of have this whole um, displaced dream world, or reverie world that you can get into in painting. But then there's the clash of that with concrete sort of non-transcendent reality. And that, the play or the contradiction between the two has always been really important to me. And so it's why a lot of my things are very kind of, um, you know, concrete, and they, they're kind of like actually acting in the space, you know, so you kind of you know, have a tattiness to it. But at the same time, there's this, the, the impressionism, you know, the, that wanting a, that even an impressionist really believed in the world, almost like this kind of, um, Like almost like, even though they were concrete and it's realist, it's it's still a dream or an evocation of like a the best of all possible worlds. And so there's a tension, and it's a fine. And for me, painting is about, you know, in a broader sense, is about bringing things together. You know, to make some kind of try and make some kind of unity. But then the idea that that unity we don't we don't have like um, a strong sort of. You know, like in the, in the Renaissance times, you know, there was like a strong sense of unity. You know, you had God, you had church, you had cathedrals. You could build these things, and there was like faith. But we don't have we don't have that. We have kind of broken up. Everything's kind of, um, it's, you know, utopia is not. We're not going to reach it. So it's, there's this sort of tension again. You know, like um, things break down. So what the diverse nature of my work comes from the sort of sense that. You know, I'll, I'll go, yeah, this is it, you know, I've found it. But then it breaks down, so I'm left with these leftover paintings, if you like. So there's this sort of, and then they then connect with different bodies of work. So I don't really have a body of work, though it has kind of, you know, putting all up together, you start getting that sense. But, but I was really, I'm really interested in, in, in differences and play and and the kind of sort of building worlds, and um, but visiting museums is really crucial to your work. Too, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. And just seeing those collections, the way that they lay. Yeah, out. and the way the collections, and the way you know people put collections together, like stamp collecting. You know, you're building collections, but it's almost like there's a distance. Somebody asked me in the opening, you know, how do you get this kind of like involvement? But then you've got a distance. The way I generally present my work is, is that I'll have three paintings. Like this is an example where I'll put three that relate quite strongly to me and they kind of make a line, you know. But for this show, I kind of find myself breaking that up and sort of spreading it out so that you kind of get relations across the space. And when I was, when I was working with um, uh, Canellis and he came in, he would treat the whole space like a painting. You know, he would kind of put colour there, and you put something there. And, and it's the same way, say, Jackson Pollock would have a canvas in any. You know, everything kind of has a unity and interrelates. You, you kind of think of the space as an installation, and it's a kind of almost like a paint. You're painting in in the moment. So my paintings become these partial things, like like to, to, to do that with, and they're sort of um, uh, interconnected. But they often come from things like Jericho's um, "The Wrath of the Medusa." So which is a huge painting, you know, it's like this massive event at the time. It's brought to the Royal Academy uh, from France, and it, it's this huge thing, and I've done this little version, which is kind of Picasso-esque. But in, you know, like in someone like Picasso, there is the whole of art history, and I kind of play with that, sort of, and end up with kind of an abstract painting with, with, with forms and shapes and these, these dots that seem to spread, you know, kind of like wander from painting to painting. And yet it's like a kind of, just enough of a holding thing, like the raft, you know, a bit like the way this fence becomes like an object. Um, and then you could start to read, you know, like indications of figures or... But it, it's, it, the idea is it's all very fluid and that things interconnect. 
And when I go to museums, I, I tend to look at things, how paintings interconnect, you know, the way there's this constant sort of like um, movement between things, you know, like that sort of like a, a molecular thing. Or So the holes actually, after a while, became um, ways of drawing in a way, almost like sculpture, like, or, um, you know, the things in the painting. So there's a, uh, I feel like I'm playing in the field of, of like art really. And, and, and I've got this, it's quite liberating to be able to just not think too much about having an identity. Having this, yeah, uh, Phil King is this, you know, the unique selling point. You kind of end up with a handwriting and a kind of movement anyway. So um, it's paradoxical. Um, I mean, I was really, I'm really interested in people like Marcel Duchamp and painting, you know, which is seen as being, how, how can that be? But he was actually, you know, an agent for painters. I mean, he wrote this great thing about Paul Clay, which was, um, he wrote, uh, Clay's experiment was adopted in the last 30 years by many other artists as a basis for newer creations in most different areas of painting. His extreme productivity never shows evidence of repetition, as is usually the case. He had so much to say that a clay never becomes another clay. So Duchamp wrote that in, in about 1949. And I read it because I, I've, I've just written an essay for um, Turps Banana magazine on Paul Clay. So I often find, because I, I, I write articles and I've written catalogue essays for artists, and I often find that Actually, it says more about me than them. <laughs> so, so um, I, I, I kind of think about this talk, and I was like pulling these things out, and I was like, oh, you know, even though it's written a long time ago, that I have a real sort of uh, loopy thinking, if you like, where things sort of return. It's like a kind of sense of um, stuff always comes back again, and um, I like. I like the idea of someone like Paul Clay, who come, it all comes back in, in, a, in a, I don't think I don't think it's not like a, a scientific experiment. It's like an experiment of where we find things always sort of um, coming back in ways we wouldn't expect. And I kind of discover that I kind of do that in my work. And I and I find myself in front of a Cezanne, say, you know, going, "Wow, this is this could be painted yesterday." And there's that there's that life in art that is really like. Um, Surprising. There's always surprises. So, in museums, you know, they're not like for myself and a lot of other artists. It's not like dusty places. They're, they're kind of like wow. You know. I was kind of interested. I'm really excited about the way that you've approached what what you see in different museums. And so, to you talk about the material side of it, and I, I get this thing sometimes where you go to a museum, and you don't see them as dusty places. You see them as these little sort of all the frame and all the sort of thing about the museum where she'll sort of really carefully try to present these little bits of canvas that people have poked yeah. and you just see this human side this quite sometimes a museum can look really tatty yeah, yeah, and yeah. you just start to look behind the frames and you just see this stuff just barely hanging you know like yeah. great artists well, I, I worked at the tape for quite a long time I mean basically in the shop but I would go back behind the scenes a bit and um, it has fascinated me you know that he's sometimes quite concrete objects, you know. There's this whole theatre, you know, this whole kind of um, life that, that really interests me, the way things interconnect. And, but, I mean, museums, after all, are mausoleums, or they're, they're kind of places where you put, things end up, you know, like auctions, you know. We kind of, painting is, is paintings are kind of finished objects. But there's, there's a sort of morbid life there. I mean, I was, um, I'm part of a generation, and I was quite close to artists that were very interested in like morbidity and and the end of things. You know, um, like Damon Hirst, dead animals, and that was all around. You know, and um, I don't know if you know the artist Glenn Brown would paint, you know, very carefully, very morbid, deathly images of of of, of canvases. And I was always sort of like, ah, there's still, you know, there's still a buzz, there's still a rhythm, and I think. I think something comes through my work is that line and rhythm. It's, it's basically um, abstract 
there's an abstract sense of rhythm, which is, after all, rhythm is something that goes, goes past you, you know, it, it comes to the past and you can predict where it's going to go, so it gives you that sense of, sort of the, an ongoing activi activity that goes right back. And um, so we've got someone like Cezanne, you know, there's a rhythm in there that, that other artists pick up on and like really, um, it, it, it's it ongoing, does, you know. It does seem that you're constantly making references to um, things that are locked in time yeah. as well. And uh, there's a certain amount of humour, I find, in them as well. Yeah, yeah, totally, which, yeah. Which, yeah, is, which yeah. is refreshing, you know, the, the energy. Yeah, I like. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think there's, a, play, there's a, a playfulness, you know, like, it comes from doodling a, a lot, you know, yeah. when you're, you're in class and you're bored, and the boredom. Yeah. And you amuse yourself, you know, and I just always try to keep that side <coughs> of it. And, and, but I've always found that in art and painting anyway. Um, th and its rhythm and is such a vital part of, of any art making. You know, you can see in very technical work, you know, that there's an inbuilt rhythm to video work, for example. You know, that, that, that um, I suppose yeah. everyone's perception of, of the work is quite different. You yeah, know, because mine is probably quite different from the next person. It's very interesting. The, the, the diversity of the kind of things that you've put up in the space. Yeah, well, it's, it's kind of a note for painters. It's like, a, you know, you're, you're supposed to be able to predict what's going to happen next. You know, like, like it's, there's a kind of, if, if uh, you know, a collector is going to invest, they, know, they want to know what you're going to be doing. Mm you know, down the line, you know. And um, it's taken me years to get to a point to go, well, it's starting to be contained enough where I can more, they, it can be predicted. But, but at the same time, uh, yeah, I don't know what I'm going to do, what my next painting is. I try to keep that sense of surprise. Mm. And these works are all from different periods of time. Like, you're looking at a 20-year period well, of... Kind painting. of. I mean, mainly, surprisingly enough, they're all over the last four years, and there's about 10, and maybe, that are older. A lot of my work is actually stuck in America, <laughs> so I remade. I, I remade the sensation of, of my past uh, bodies of work. That's interesting. So it's like you know, I tried to get that sense of like um, uh, yeah, but it's nice. I can I can I can go. Uh, you know, I want to paint. I want to paint the view out the window now. You know, and there's no there's nothing to say. Oh no, you got to make you know a minimalist sculpture now. That's what you do now. You know, or this. You know, I can just go and do that. And um, you know, there's that freedom and su to su surprise myself. And it's kind of a really big no-no as a professional, being professional, is to have that, you know, um, profession. You're professing something, you know. So, yeah, there's, but I'm professing the difference thing, you know, which, which to be fair, a lot of our other artists do too. But, you know, that's where I've kind of found myself. It's taken a very long time to have the confidence to go, I'm not just losing it all the time. But I think you've looked at the work mm. here in a sort of really objective way. You know, you talk about this as a four-year period of making these particular works. The older works are going to be quite different to the new works. It's just the way you've approached them and the things you're looking at. Kind of, but they, they definitely, you know, like, like um, I mean, there's, this was 94 or 5, and this is uh, last week. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, this is like about a month ago. So. I mean, though this is obviously a seascape and this is kind of abstract, the blue and the lines and the energy, you know, it's all, you know, part of the... And there's always clouds, you know, there's always these recurrent motifs, you know, the whole clouds, you know, they're not in every painting, but they reoccur. Um, is that like a kind of personal alphabet? Yeah. <laughs> of shapes? Yeah, no, slide. totally, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I can see that with it through... Yeah, you, know, you can identify that, can't you, in some of the pieces? Yeah, and I find that, you know, like, um, I don't try and be too conscious about it, because, like, say, for this one, um, that was set out as a straight copy of a Corbel painting. But then, you know, you start getting the clouds, and there's a kind of cobra aesthetic starts happening in the trees, you know. And so there's combinations of really, like, clashing, clashing things, you know. Yeah. And, and the idea of these small, beautiful, or being you know, blown up on a crappy bit yeah. of paper. Yeah. Um, just sort of, I like that thing, you know. Yeah. And, and then it's got Manet and the Impressionist in it. 
and I like the idea of him being an impressionist, not just being an impressionist, but being, you know, like an artist who, who's being, you know, pretending to be another yeah. artist. You know, I was playing things. I'll be, I'll be that kind of painter, and I'll be this kind of painter. You know, so there's like a. I don't want to. I don't want to use the, use the word schizophrenia because it's really loaded and it's and there's lots of pain. But I'd love to find a new word for the not having an, a, a set identity. You know, like a, kind of eclectic. Yeah, but not, yeah, eclectic. So again, there isn't yeah. there isn't like a positive way um, to say what I'm doing. There's not yeah. in the book. I'd, I'd I'd like to do a, a PhD one day in which I kind of try to try to find positive, you know, like a way to say. We can be different personalities, you know, without being nuts. You know. mm -hmm. So yeah, there's that that goes on, and then, and there's caricature, and there's uh, like the impression being impressionist. There's a caricature element. So like you know, that's like Paul Cezanne, you know, which I did recently. And um, but then again, there was always caricature element in Picasso. You know, it's not like it's an, it's again it's a big part of you know art. I think is very important. So you, you know, the reaction of the Demoiselle Avignon, you know, why, why, you could be a caricaturist, you know, uh, these cartoons, you know, and up like 1907. And, and I, I find, I find like ways into, I'm really fascinated with art history. I've got lots of art historian friends, you know, and I'm always trying to find ways in that they haven't thought of, you know. Because, because, you, because when you paint, you, you do find your way into what artists were doing in a way that, Someone who's an art historian doesn't really, you know, can't really you know, sort of get, you know. But, um, I mean, but I'll, I'll, I'll indulge myself, you know, like I'll like suddenly be watching the World Cup and I'll be doing lots of different World Cup tournaments, you know. And I don't plan to do that. I haven't really got an agenda, you know, I'm not a football painter. But I find it really hilarious, you know, that, that there's that kind of, the colour, you know, colour, big colour TV and then getting the bright colours. Brazil and you know in your living room you know so they've got the set of the World Cup paintings down there which which I presented like a, a Donald Judd minimalist stack on the wall which is quite deliberate you know because this kind of painting I mean the thing about painting is of all the arts is the closest to being amateur in a way like it's hard to imagine yourself being an amateur conceptual artist or an amateur sculpture or potter but being a painter you can really disappear into being like this could really be not very good, you know, not professional, or whatever. So there's always that, and there's a risk involved. But um, I think, you know, like minimalism, you know, which I love, um, it doesn't have that, you know. But I think you, because because you're you're quite informed, your conscious decision is made. It's a precarious thing, isn't it? When you paint, you can take in one direction or another. Yeah. But it's knowing when to seize on that moment instinctively to make it work. Yeah. But you obviously know what to do. Well, I mean, I, I got but, paintings here that I that I rejected, you know, that I just yeah. threw away. Yeah. And they were literally thrown away, and then I found them again, and I was like, hey, wow, actually, I was doing this, you know. So they come, they come back, you know, like I was doing. I didn't even know I was doing this, but here we go, you know. So um, yeah, and and this idea of sets as well, they become like cart, they become like, you know, it's like collecting, as I said earlier, but it's the like. Um, Playing cards, you know, when you deal cards out, and there's different, there's different options become available. There's different futures possible. There's different, um, you know, like this, this could be a different show, you know, depending on chance. Yeah, you've composed it really specifically to this space. It'll, it won't be different everywhere. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And you've yeah. you've divided the space. Yeah. Well, I kind of thought it was funny that you know, like, like the way it worked out was I got my kind of like. Walk New York through. Gallery, you know, like <laughs> Chelsea, or maybe even Cork Street, you know, which is, which is the, um, the standard walk, the standard white wall, and you know, my kind of grungy paintings. Yeah, this is the American Mike, you know, and then you've got your museum wall, you know, which is kind of like, um, to me, it's like a museum, you know, it's kind of got the old sense of. And uh, what about your drawing of a well, yeah. self-portrait? Well, uh, yeah, I'm not quite sure what to say about these, apart from the fact that I find it quite funny to draw self-portraits. Oh. But copy self-portraits yeah. is another, not like, this is my, you know, I, I, 
like I think artists are used as a model of individualism in a way. And, and, and not that I'm against individualism, but I'm like questioning it. You know, it's like, do we do we have to be? You know, mm. um, that kind of identity all the time. You know, the cliche sort of thing. So I'm like. Um, I wouldn't want to say I've come up with any solutions or answers to anything. It's more like I see my work as a challenge to myself or, or problem, problematics. But you do a self portrait of yourself. Yeah, but well now, because it's like they're all trying to do. Because you know, yeah. I think the other thing I like a lot of the, the objects and things that like, you know, when you make a hole in a painting, that's, that's almost like a, quite aggressive. It's like an anti art thing to do. Mm -hmm. But I think we're, we, you know, after the First World War, when people were kind of basically so disgusted with the values that, that led to the First World War. Anti-art became part of art, so you, so there's it's like a mixture of the two. What we have now, it's like kind of it's both art and anti-art at the same time, and that again is the tension. And I think painting is a really good place to do that because it a it can not it can both not be art and be art. You know, it's like a kind of embarrassing. It, I think in the contemporary art terms, painting is there has a certain embarrassment about it at the same time as being the thing that sells best. So it's kind of got a, it's a problematic area. It's that, uh, yeah, that's a commodity uh, sort of labor that is still got in. Yeah, it's like when the, when the crash came. Yeah. When, the, when the 2008 crash came, everybody started painting again because people could just go and do it in the studios. And, you must have seen you know. that a lot in America, when you were in America. In America, when I was, I was in California. These three paintings were done in California. Yeah. And I lived there for four years in, in, in Berkeley. I was lucky enough to show there as well. So. I am, um, you know, so bright colours. It's a bit of a It's really lovely. It's, it's very the weather is gorgeous. It's yeah. very cold. Yes, Raul Duffy, yeah. And, 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 but the, the Americans really aren't like that keen on um, the School of Paris aesthetic. Oh. You know? So of course I started doing the School of Paris aesthetic. <laughs> I'm like perverse. So, um, and then, um, yeah, so I did these, and they, this was sort of around the area. I used to drive up to the Napa Valley, and there were these amazing vineyards. And for me, it was like being in the south of France, you know, but rich, you know, super wealthy. And it was like really, uh, and the sun sunny, and so these come out of that sort of experience. But again, you've got these, you know, the dots that play across, and, you know, so I got, you know, I quite, I put the fuck on the show, because it kind of makes me think of the, you know, the sort of, it's not very American. In space. No, not very American. It's <laughs> not like, um, that one. But they do. They, I mean, they, they play a lot. Yeah, yeah. It's especially um, in school, girls play, you know, they're very really serious. They're very really serious teams. So um, my daughter played football, soccer. And, um, but I also like the idea, it's like knocked about. I couldn't find a really good football, I couldn't find a good one. And then a friend of mine's um, had loads in the garden, and this is a really old one. So like, it's like kicked around by like my paintings, in a way. So there's this like a, it's like a history or a kind of a, yeah, I was too scared to touch that. I thought you painted it. <laughs> <laughs> and it, and um, yeah, it's like um, play. Yeah, the, I mean, and it kind of, I hope it sort of reveals a sense that these, these are all emotions somehow. There's an animation involved. Like I like um, the animation I did with Pascal in the in the back room. I've done a lot of little animations in my doodles and things that. Um, I kind of see my, I kind of see the actual drawing itself, like, like the strip of football pictures. You know, they, there's kind of, um, they could be animated in a way, you know, the movie. And I like, I like the idea of football playing into that. So there's this sort of like a, a set, as in theatre set, as well as set, as in set thing. You know, that, um, one of the one of the great things about. Um, the artist of Canales was is, is, is the dramatic side of his work. It's really kind of almost like um, something not theatrical but dramatic. You know, there's a real sort of weight to it, and a sense of space. And, and um, I like. I mean, I kind of think painting sets set scenes. You know, when you put a painting in a room, it changes the room, it creates a fiction that you can inhabit somehow. And um, yeah, so I'm kind of involved in that. So each, each of these works, you know, they kind of have a... Okay, back into that room just for a second. You say when you put a picture in a room, do you mean like a domestic room or a museum room? 
Well, you know, like I made this, why I put this mantelpiece was that I was, um, I was kind of, it's like a really crap mantelpiece. I just wanted it to indicate, like, just hints at being a mantelpiece. And this is really great because already, you know, you have the hot thing. And it's so uh, I kind of wanted to set, to set a domestic space, you know, and the paintings kind of go above the. That's where they go, really, in a, in a, in a room. And, and like, and I, I did. I just made an impression again, the impressionist of the fireplace. You know, like I wanted to. And I, I kind of, I wanted it to be better than it is, but I'm kind of happy that it's like slightly crappy, you know, because it, it sort of indicates, it's like I'm trying to be Rachel Whiteley, but... <laughs> <laughs> you know, just, just, and there's the humour, there's supposedly humour in it. I mean, I think it's funny. But anyway, it's game with the, the painting as well. I mean, this, this is one of my football ones that I like the idea of the, the goal, you know, the whole... <laughs> gone through it so so there's this sort of sense of play somebody asked me what the holes do but they, they do different things in each painting do you uh, do the hole after you finish painting depends i mean i have got three canvases because they had holes in them which is <laughs> <great>. <laughs> <laughs> so then i use that yeah. you know but other ones you know it's like oh it's really this painting I'm just, this is not really not working and then it, you know do you see do you see um paintings like the association of them all together um, independently, you know, would you exhibit a painting necessarily on its own? Probably? Yeah, I think I'd be okay, but I mean, it's a hard one, really. I do think it's a paradox that, that you know, like you used to, painting is this sort of absolute, you know, self-contained thing, and they do, they do work for me on their own. I do spend a lot of time with them on their own, but then I, I love that moment when I put two, two next to them, and then you have this three, this story is developed. That I hadn't intended, so so I, I'd rather like stick to putting three pictures together because yeah. it kind of um, I, two next to each other. It's not quite it. Three, it's it's a trick thing, but it's um, it's like the old Roman books, you know, they used to have, which which would, which would be um, a triptych, and they ended up as altar pieces. Uh, you know, so you'd have your triptych above your altar piece. So so I kind of think about that a lot, and where what. Painting is in a domestic space, like the Romans used to have, where the TV is now, they would have a little corner temple in their rooms. And a painting was part of that too, you know, like images. And sometimes they have little theatres, you know, little figures yeah. in the corner, you know, I can't remember the court now. So I'm really interested in like really old ways in which painting came to be used, you know. Like why, you know? Because the the idea of like the, the, the what used to be called the bourgeois um, role for the painting, the, the tableau in France or, or even in uh, in Holland was that um, you had these discrete objects that were traded, you know, that, that were a certain size. And one of the things that that really hit me about, you know, Canellis came and talked to me and says, I'm a painter, but painting's just not possible. We don't have the economy. Nobody buys paintings anymore. We don't have the bourgeois, the bourgeois are finished. We have an industrial societies and like, you know, people, we have dem democratic and the old bourgeois, you know, rich person who collects paintings is finished. They're not going to do it anymore. They're not the ruling class anymore. So we, painting's done, you know, politically. And that was like, by the end of my BA, I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> and it was work? true. Well, I don't know, but it's a problem. You know, I think... Um, I think uh, you know painting is part of the values of an old, old liberalism, and uh, we have a neoliberalism now. So we exist in a totally different planet. You know? But you're, you're putting that theatre thing back in because you know the older values of it were far more than a sort of a commodity to buy sell market. It was well, it, yeah, because... it was a sort of worship function, and even the old cave paintings. Well, there's a life, sort of... and, a, and maybe ancestor worship and all that lot. There is a life, and I'm very interested in line. I mean, you can tell that there, if there's a consistent thing through the paintings, it's really like, I like colour, but line is this consistent thing. But it's, but it's an interrupted and broken line. You know, it's like, that's why, you know, it, it sort of goes across, um, just cross paintings. This, this line is almost like that fluid thing in space. You know, I don't know if you've seen those pictures of Picasso drawing in space. 
on a glass yeah. with a light, you know, yeah. he, he draws. It, and it, and it, yeah. you know, I think of that, yeah. and then the paintings are sort of like captures of that. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, um, but my paintings, they all, they're all like failures in terms of that. You know, there is this paradise where line and animation and life, you know, can be believed in, but you end up with one of these, you know. But it's still kind of like a painting in a museum. It's still, there's still a lot, there's still an indication of it. It's something older, going back to cave painting. It's really physical painting, isn't it? Yeah, we got that. You know, it's cave painting. I mean, I, when I was a kid, I, I used to see, being, being you know, in the south of France, I used to go to the caves. I was lucky enough to go to Lascaux, the original, when I was a little kid, you know. And then you get the, the candlelight flickering and then the lines moving. And so, you know, something like this is sort of, you know, you have this kind of primitivistic thing, you know. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, just, I'm not cynical about it, but, I, I, you know, it comes from an old experience, you know, of animals and life. I mean, animation comes from anima, animals, you know. So when I talk about animation, it's like that is um, in the work, you know. I mean, even in that um, sort of Renaissance um, uh, drawing thing at the end, the big old guy with the beard, the actual mark making is is very, you know, it's very much life, you know, the Van Gogh, um, you know, really like um, fortune telling, and that's all, you know, you're looking ahead, you know, that's kind of trying to think what the future's going to be, and I think painting does predict, so that rhythm thing, it's contradictions. Just sense of optimism there. Yeah, I hope, you know, <laughs> but yeah, you know, like, oh, so what's, what's the future going to be, yeah. you know? And again, it's like tarot cards. The, um, I used, I, I went through a whole period of, like, using the colours from the tarot card, from the Marseille deck, you know, yeah. where it's, um, uh, like at art college, you know, we're told, like, mute your colour, you know, like, try and have, um, like, almost like a musical tone in your, in your painting, you know, like, have a, have a restriction of the colours, you know, don't don't have too many complementary contrasts. And then we get these tarot cards and like bang, you know, from the Middle Ages. And they're like, you know, red, green, blue, orange, you know, it's all in there. So I, I went, okay, I'm gonna not think about colour, I'm just gonna take that and then bang, you know. And um, that was very liberating for me not to not to be a paint not to be a colourist. Um, and of course in it sort of comes back, you know. It's really interesting for you to say that you knew Peter Kinney, because I did the fellowship at Bath Academy. Right. I knew Peter very well. Right, oh, he's lovely, isn't he? I'll have to talk to you later about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was really, yeah, yeah really sad, because he, he yeah, yeah. But he, he had a, yeah, I'll talk to you later, but yeah. But he, he, he you know, that, that was, and my, my, you know, my mother's a painter as well. She was, a, she was, she went to Cardiff Art College in the 1950s, yeah. and was did um, Nicholas de style type and that, and very kind of like abstractions, but landscape abstraction. And um, I, that kind of idea of the 50s painting Peter Kinley, and you know, it's always really strong. And uh, so, there's, but there's there's that ambivalence, you know. That, so I also went to Goldsmiths College at the heyday of Goldsmiths College, you know, it was just, yeah. The heyday? Well, you know, it was like, well, it was the YBA. Yeah. Yeah, when so was the, the heyday? Yeah, well, the, well the, the YBA moment, you know. And, and, and Is that 88? 88, 87, um, well, and then I, I was on the m &E. But they, um, yeah, it was like painting was just like, well, anything, art history. Let's just say art history was really like, you know, uh, not by everyone, but um, there was, there was, yeah. You don't do that anymore. That, that's old. This is new. So, so. Uh, but I was always. I used to call my paintings old paintings. You know, like present them as old paintings. Like I had playing against the old and the new. It's always quite interesting for me. I'm not like bothered about being a contemporary artist. Yeah, I. I mean, I've always found it difficult to categorize art in that sense. Yeah. Because it's timeless, really. I mean, you can look at a Titian, or uh, you can look at a Damien Hirst and say it's equally as good. It doesn't matter when it's done, really. It doesn't exactly. make any difference. Yeah, yeah. But there was a, there was a sense amongst a lot of my fellow students at that time that, oh, and you know, yeah. why are you doing that? You know, 
back home. So, so they had that going on. But um, because I had the MS Canalis experience, you know, I was very open to Burks at the time because he suddenly he was doing, he was someone my age, yeah. taking on an artist like that, you know. So at the time, it was, you know, like, wow. And um, but uh, yeah. I wrote. I wrote a lot at that time as well. I was doing the catalogue essays and they did the press releases for, for people. I'm just doing this nut, nutty, nutty writing. And um, people would use it for the catalogue essays. So that was, that was quite an interesting time. And, um, it, I remember writing at the time about um, for Rebecca Warren, the artist. And um, she, was, she was always like, she did this show which was kind of very influential on me because it was all because I spent a week with them as they're hanging it. And it was all little throwaway bits and pieces and just just things didn't really have to be art or not. It was more the kind of narratives that were set up between objects. And they did it with two artists together, so you had the play going on between them. And it was really rich. It looked very minimal, but it had this really rich interactions, you know, and that would that would made me feel like, oh, you know, that's kind of like my my work could be. From the writing thing, this sort of sense of bits and pieces, you know, rather than like whole self-contained things, you know. So the, the, um, the paintings are like partial things, you know, drawings, you know, like those those look like drawings, they're actually inkjet prints. So the self-portraits, they're not even very original, you know. They're like it's all it's all not quite up to um, museum standards original, you know, the, the canvases are store-bought from the works, you know, there's a cheap, there's a cheap aesthetic, you know, it's a, mainly acrylic, it's not the best paint, you know, though I will sometimes get a really expensive thing and sneak it in there. <laughs> it's a cheap, it's a cheap <laughs> expensive it's, acrylic or a bit Windsor and Newton? Yeah, 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 yeah. Hot of Holland, you know. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I do, like, I do spend a lot of time going to galleries and we've had such a run of incredible shows in London, Malavig, Tease. I don't let myself go. Oh, I don't want to surrender to it. You know, I'm like, ah, lose myself. You know, and I can afford to with my work. But a lot of artists are like, not my thing. That's I'm going to take five years to digest the Matisse show. You know, well, I kind of go out and do a painting quick. You know, like I let myself be influenced and lost because these these shows when they, when you get a Malavik show that comes up. You know, a lot of that work, or the Paul Clay show, you know, the tape, it, it's a revelation, you know, you don't, you, they bring stuff together, so I mean, all I can say is, you, you know, we had Paul Clay, I went to the Brax show in Paris, and there's been a whole run of, but this, that work is, for me, is still really disorientated. It's not finished, you know. But these, these shows that you're talking about, they're not like museum collection as usual, they're actually really high powered presentations yeah, yeah, and they're like yeah, yeah, yeah. the negotiations of what you know paintings and what chronological order and how the catalogue's written. There's no nutty writing in those catalogues. It's gotta be you know it's mm -hmm. gotta to answer to the collectors, it's gotta to answer to museums. Yeah, the whole and world, well. you know. So uh, well, but and so the actual collection of this stuff is really quite intense. Mm -hmm. And I'm really fascinated by how you can lighten and yet present a collection of work in a space and you set it out in different sets, you respond to the space and it's like it's got that whole ethos of what a high powered show is but you've done it, it's in your control it's like you've taken the museum and you put it back into your own living room almost. Well I'm really interested in Marcel Bruthars, the artist who uh, he made his own museums you know like he would have the museum is ugly called it where he, this artist, you know, would have catalogues and you know collections of work, and he invented it all. You know, it was his, all his own work, and he, so he invented his own museum in a way. So I'm quite taking that on board, but you know, not not in a again in a partial way. You know, all my ideas don't quite reach fruition. Like it's all very uh, poetic in a way. It's it's sort of so when I say like Marcel, when I say it's a museum, it's not really a museum. It's like that's not really a diamond, you know. That's like a cut-out cardboard thing. But I think I love that idea of play and just um, make-believe. 
in art, you know. I think we need more make believe, you know. But I think there's like a moral, you know. But then it's terribly real, you know. You have make believe and then crow. Try not to think about it too much, and then you're left with this thing, and you're like, you know, what is it, you know? And I love the story like Barney Newman, did a, you know, the painter did a strife, and then he was like, pulled the tape off, and then sat there looking at it for like two years, you know. So there's that kind of, I don't know quite how it works, and the fact there's two canvases stuck together is like his assemblage aesthetic, but it's painting, it's like, a, it's like an image of it, and then there's this sort of sense of like, I don't know. I don't I really, you know, I would, um, it's a problem for me, you know, I don't quite know what it is. You know, and I think that's healthy. I think, um, Quite often when um, people say to justify or define what a great painting is, and I think you can't quite put your finger on it as to why that works. Yeah. And it transcends just an illustration or an idea, becomes something in its own right. Yeah. You know, it exists in inverted commas. That's why, you know, really brilliant paintings, they don't need justification really. I work as a translator as well, and I, I just translated this essay by Jean Genet on Giacometti. And in that, you know, Giacometti's like, uh, Genet says he notices a sculpture underneath the table, and then like, um, he's like, wow, you know, why is that? So he kicked it over, you know. And, and Giacometti's like, well, if it's any good, it will, it'll be good, you know. You don't have to. I don't, have to, I don't have to decide whether it's good or not. It will, you know, if it's any good. So a lot of my work's like that. You know, like, like this, this was just sitting around, you know, just... And then it kind of went... I can't really, I couldn't really explain to you why, really. I mean, this was supposed to be... Um, my sister got married, so it's her and her new husband. And I, I, I was trying to paint them, you know, and it's really, really hard to do two, do two likenesses. Like, you can get one and then you get another one, but to get two... So this is kind of a failed attempt, but I really hope she doesn't see it actually. But it really like um, <laughs> connects to Leger and you know like yeah. the one they had was photorealist. You know I can do that, um, but I just um, you know it insists. It's got its own it demand. You know demanded to be in the show. You know, so I try not to think too much. You know like. Um, I quite like those smiling people when you look at those smiling people yeah. over there. <laughs> Very different smiling people. Yeah. Yeah, but it's also a sense it could could be painted out as well. There's a sense of trace. I've started using chalk, charcoal a bit, you know, which is both a really traditional thing. And then to do um, like a cartoon with it with their rubbing out, you know, it's like a trace, you know, like for lying to have a life, it has to have that sense of it not being forever somehow, like a paradox, you know, it's like kind of, I mean, I went to the, the William Blake show last night, I mean, uh, yesterday, at, in Oxford, and um, he wrote some of these, writing about lying in that, and how lying is the most important thing, and I was like, yeah. And it's that visionary thing. That I, secretly, you know, I, I find my work like a visionary for myself. You know, like it predicts stuff. But um, like the tarot cards. Yeah, you know, I can't believe. Oh, you know, good things will come. <laughs> but it's it's very you know a fiction. But uh, yeah, it's a very real fiction. That's the whole loop, isn't it? It is a loop. It's loopy. The work's loopy. Mm. You know. And it's a, that's where the humour is as well. I mean, I, you know, I kind of... Um, I made a Spike Milligan drawing over there. He did one by Anthony. That was just a, yeah. So this, this section is the caricature section. So this is a... I combined... Um, there's a, there was a, a French anarchist called Louise Michel, who was in the French commune, the Paris commune, which is very famous in France. And um, her funeral was around the time that um, Picasso painted Demoiselle d'Avignon. And I, I kind of thought, that Demoiselle is like a caricature of Louis Michel. So I combine the two things, you know, so it's like a caricature. And it's like a, 
historical game, but it it sort of um, kind of makes a strange painting, really. I think like something you can't quite. Uh, And again, that thing about Picasso being a caricaturist. But Spike Milligan is always a favourite. <laughs> like, this strange Indian you know, Army thing. And like, Prince Charles, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> then, you know, there's like, um, there is a default style, sort of curious, deep, um, abstract style. Suzanne, then, you know, that I find myself. Um, there's habits, you know, I think paint, painters have habits as well, so there's both like accepting that, kind of going, oh, that's a bad one, you know, but you've got to get rid of that. But habits have got a tendency to come back, and so, you know, you have this sort of generic. Um, generic modern painting in a way, but it actually has a. It's a real space to me. I mean, I know, you know, I know where I painted that. I think it captures the captures the feeling of it, but at the same time, it's sort of, you know, this strange, sort of slightly ugly object. Hello, <coughs> 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 you Give me time for a moment. Have I? I did this last time. I did a talk. <laughs> you called me. You called me. All right. I would have done that in ten minutes. You know, when when I feel. <laughs> What to say? Not that we're telling you, it's just whatever. No, no, okay. Well, you can carry on. Yeah, no. Any questions? Any other questions? I've got lots of questions. I don't know, I'd like to show this. I'd like to, it'd be nice, you know, I could do this in different configurations and different paintings. And like, I'd like to have the only part of those second paintings that would change our relationships. Yeah, you know, I, I kind of found it refreshing. I'm doing it in my show. I think I like the way it's kind of hanging. Nice to walk in there and see it. It's very hard to, to do it in a way that each painting gets like attention. You know, that doesn't become generalised. I do have this technique where I kind of make gaps. Yeah. So a rhythm, there's a rhythm set up, but then I disrupted it all anyway. What I tend to do. So, but then when I hung from that end and I kind of had this rhythm, and then I kind of then went and put paintings in the gaps. But it, I hope there's a kind of rhythmic sense to it. It really has got rhythm to it. As soon as you start. And it's numbed to it. I mean, why else is that a sea of isolated and separated? Yeah. yeah. Well, I can say that's my, this is my um, village hall section. <laughs> no. The amateur painting competition. But it's um, like, yeah, it's different, different, different personality. But if, uh, if you see, there's a little animation around the corner, which people don't see, but I did uh, with Pascal here years ago. He, um, he took one of my doodles and drew uh, this amazing analysis of it. So uh, do, do go and have a look. It's still quite Yeah, it's, it's in sort of a. Yeah, so try to put the line Oh, well, it's been a lot of work, but I, I type, I've got a list of the titles and so on. Yeah, I don't even tend to type on my work too much. Um, but I, one thing in the future you know, I want to do is to make that get really complicated in terms of my... You know, I really like that master of brutalism and art this morning, and the whole world, you know. It's like um, invented.
And we didn't get the Disney implications. The title is very complicated. Cosmology, I think I can like, go that way. I like to have books, you know. Somebody asked me if I'd made out my CD, which I have, but they thought it was a fiction. There's a make believe element to it. When I was at, um, when I was at, um, Goldsmith, something else.